My name is Sinan Aral. I'm a professor at the NYU Stern School of Business and at MIT. Uh, and for the last 10 or 12 years, I've been studying social networks, large graphs, and, and doing data mining on them. And in particular, I focus on how information moves through social networks and how behaviors spread in social networks. So the jargony terms for, for what I'm talking about are virality and word of mouth how information is moving, and what makes things go viral. And today I want to talk uh, in particular about uh, two things, uh, which are social contagions in networks and causality, the importance of separating correlation from causation in estimates of word of mouth and social contagion in networks. And I want to start with the story of a particular tweet that was tweeted uh, recently that's been getting a lot of attention. Uh, and no, it's not the tweet that you're probably thinking about. Frankly, if we didn't talk about Tweenergate uh, ever again, it would be too soon. Um, I'm actually talking about this tweet uh, by Keith Urban on May 1st. And uh, so on May 1st, Keith tweeted, uh, I'm told by a reputable person that they've killed Osama bin Laden. And at the time that Keith tweeted this tweet, he wasn't the first person to be speculating about Osama bin Laden's death. Uh, and he wasn't particularly influential uh, by any definition of influencer or influential that I've seen at any data mining conference or social networking conference. At the time that he tweeted this, he had about 300 followers. Um, but after he tweeted this, uh, it created a Twitter cascade uh, that looked like this, okay? Uh, of tweets and retweets and forwarding of his, of his tweet. And so I study these types of, of networks, and these beautiful visualizations help us understand sort of how information and behavior are moving from person to person in a social network. Uh, and when people see this kind of a visualization, they immediately think to themselves, wow, you know, do my tweet cascades look like that too? And I can say with confidence that they don't. Um, your, your tweet cascades and mine look more like this. Um, and we know now in data that approximately 99% of 99% uh, of all um, cascades on Twitter have a depth less than one. Okay, and that's not terrible news because there are about a billion tweets per week, so that's about 10 million tweets that are spreading. And so I study the process of how these types of information and behavior spread in these social networks. And it's not just about online behaviors, right? So if you think about it, our, word is, our world is very social. And peer influence is a big part of how we make decisions in our lives. If you ever were a smoker, you might remember the first cool kid in school that sort of got you interested in smoking down by the, under the bleachers. And if you ever then quit smoking, you probably know someone in your life very close to you, either part of your family or a friend, that got you to quit smoking. And in fact, all of the decisions we make in our lives are subject to some form of peer influence and socialization. And so I study that process because I believe uh, that if we can understand how behaviors spread uh, in a social network and thus in a population, uh, from person to person to person to person, uh, that we could potentially promote uh, behaviors like these, condom use, uh, exercise, or financial responsibility. Ed Norton was just talking about charitable, charitable giving. Um, Ed, if you, wanna, if you wanna collaborate with me on making charitable giving go viral, call me. Um, it's not just about promoting these kinds of positive behaviors. I think that we can also contain uh, negative behaviors like smoking or dirty needle sharing. Um, and so I mine massive social networks, uh, and because I'm at a business school, uh, one of the obvious applications of this kind of scientific research is in understanding how our social environment drives our consumer demand, our purchasing decisions. And so uh, Wired's cover in the UK not so long ago was about social commerce. And this was the headline, Commerce Gets Social, How Your Networks Are Driving What You Buy. So how does observing people liking a product affect your likelihood of purchasing that product? What about referrals by friends that are made through social networks? How does that affect your consumer demand? So I mine massive social network data to understand how peers influence each other to do everything from buy a product, vote for a different political candidate, or take an HIV test. And one of the most important scientific endeavors in this is causal statistical estimation. So I have this cartoon on my door in my office, and it's two friends talking. 
Uh, and one friend says to the other, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. And the friend says, it sounds like the class helped. And the guy goes, well, maybe. And the, the idea here is that uh, maybe this guy has a proclivity for understanding statistics and interest in statistics, and so selects into the statistics class, creating the correlation between taking the class and knowing about statistics. And the class isn't teaching him all that much about statistics or more, as much as the average person, okay? Um, and so in network science, this is known as the reflection problem. So we have abundant evidence now that human behaviors tend to cluster in network space and in time. And the real question is, is this because of peers influencing one another or alternative explanations? And let me give you an, uh, an example. So in 2007, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler published this really good study in the New England Journal of Medicine about obesity uh, being contagious. And what this uh, study showed was that body mass index increases are correlated over time amongst friends. Okay, so you had pockets of obese people and pockets of skinny people, and this was picked up by the collective unconscious and the media, and you got these news stories like this one in the New York Times Magazine front page cover, are your friends making you fat? Okay, and that is a very causal statement, right? So we have evidence of correlation among obesity and body mass index increases, and then we have claims of causation, that your friends are making you fat. But there could be alternative explanations that explain this correlation, like homophily. And what homophily means is very simple. Birds of a feather flock together. Okay, we tend to make friends with people who are like ourselves, and we know this now. There's abundant evidence on this. And so if we tend to make friends with people who are like ourselves, marathon runners might become friends with marathon runners, and those people who like the all-you-can-eat line uh, at buffet at Denny's might become friends, and this would cause pockets of obesity and pockets of uh, less obesity in the network, and this could also explain the correlation in obesity over time in a social network. And this is not new news. Okay, this was originally this quote, birds of a feather flock together, was originally attributed to Robert Burton in the 1500s, but it's even older than that because before Robert Burton, it was Aristotle who was saying that people love those who are like themselves, and before Aristotle, it was Plato who was saying similarity begets friendship, and just to prove to you that a long line of worthy scholars have made this argument, it was my mom who said, hanging out with a bad crowd will get you into trouble. Um, <laughs> And she wasn't too pleased when I told her that she might have gotten the causal structure of that sentence reversed. She wasn't really happy about that. So um, uh, Slate ran an article which was titled, Everything is Contagious, which was ironically about the contagion amongst academics to publish contagion studies. So it's not just that obesity is contagious, but apparently uh, happiness is contagious, and product adoption is contagious, and cooperation is contagious, and the one that I have the hardest time figuring out, loneliness is contagious. Not exactly sure how that works, but uh, there could be alternative explanations besides causal peer influence uh, for these results, like the reflection problem, or birds of a feather flock together, or confounding factors. So confounding factors are just that friends who are linked together in a social network tend to be exposed to the same external stimuli. Maybe they work together and the office has a promotion on health benefits, or maybe they live in the same neighborhood and a new all-you-can-eat buffet opens up down the street. So there are other explanations for uh, this, this, uh, these results. Now, uh, the reason this is important is for two reasons. The causal structure of the underlying dynamic process of the spread of a behavior through a social network implies different diffusion properties for the behavior. Where is it going to go next? So who should we target if we're intending to promote or contain this behavior? And it implies different optimal containment or promotion policies. Different policies will succeed depending on the correct estimation of separating correlation from causation. So we studied uh, a network. Uh, that was uh, generously given to us, the data was given to us by Yahoo, and it was 30 million people interacting over instant messenger daily for about six months, and we combined this network data uh, with data on a product that was being launched over this network and observed the day-by-day -day adoption uh, of the product in this network, and we got this data in order to devise new statistical techniques to separate uh, peer influence and contagion on one hand 
uh, from confounding factors and homophily on the other. And what we found was that, um, that uh, in this network, if we had attributed all of the correlation to peer influence, we would have overestimated peer influence by up to 700%, and that 50% uh, of the contagion was really just observable homophily correlated preferences amongst friends. And I tell this result to my friends, and I'm like, you know, this result, 700%, you know, 50, 50%, and they go, wow, Sinan, you are a big nerd. You know, I mean, who cares, 700%, 50%, this sounds really scientific, why should it matter? And I tell them uh, that the reason it matters is because the policy you use depends on getting that estimation correct in the first place. So let me give you an example. If I gave you a data set of a behavior that was correlated in a network over time, be it HIV testing, smoking, charitable giving, product adoption, et cetera, and in one case I told you that 90% of the correlation amongst friends in adopting this behavior was because of peer influence, and 10% was because of homophily, and in the second case it was the reverse. 90% was because of homophily, and 10% was because of peer influence, in the first case where peer influence ruled, you would want to adopt a peer-to-peer -peer strategy. You would want to try to get people to bring their friends to the behavior by giving them incentives to do peer referrals, et cetera. In the second strategy, you would in the second case, you would just want to adopt a traditional strategy of market segmentation based on observable demographic characteristics, which themselves will be correlated amongst friends, and target people who are likely to adopt or not adopt uh, the behavior. And so um, the, the Yahoo study was limited for two reasons. The first was because it was about an already existing product, and the second was because it was observational data, and really the holy grail of causal estimation of this kind of peer influence is randomized trials. So we built a uh, platform for conducting randomized trials amongst millions of people on the web, uh, and we asked a more advanced question, which is, uh, forget plopping a viral marketing strategy on top of an existing product. Can we design the original product to go viral in the design phase? And so we looked at a couple of specific features that you could add to a product, personal invitations and passive awareness. And think about personal invitations like if I gave half the people in this room the ability to invite their friends to the Next Work conference next year, and I gave the other half of the room t-shirts that said that they went to Next Work. Which of these two would be more effective at generating peer influence on their friends to come to the conference next year? And what we found was that, indeed, personal invitations were about three times more persuasive than the passive awareness campaign. And this makes sense. It's about uh, persuading your friend individually. Uh, however, even though personal invitations nearly doubled the contagion in the population that we studied, the passive awareness uh, created much more adoption of the behavior. And the reason is because more people saw those messages, even though those messages were left less effective per message. But it's even more complicated than that uh, because uh, Indeed, it was the personal invitations that resulted in more people engaging with the behavior over time rather than just adopting it and churning away. So in the last session, we saw that it's not just about adopting the behavior, but we want to create a sustained adoption of the behavior over time, and personal invitations were much more effective at doing that. Um, and so what we found in this study was actually that there is a virtuous cycle in viral product design that when you uh, create more peer adoption, it creates more engagement, and when you create more engagement, it generates more messages and personal invitations, which creates more peer adoption, which creates more peer engagement, et cetera. And whenever I show this result in an audience like this, I can immediately tell who the marketers are, because they start to sort of lean forward in their seats a little bit. But it's not just about business. It's not just about selling products. We're applying the same science to HIV testing in Africa. How can we get friends to convince their friends to take an HIV test? What are the optimal incentive policies that will generate uh, this behavior? And I'll leave you with a final result, because it's not just about the influence of individuals in a social network, but it's also the susceptibility of, of people to influence from their friends. So we conducted a, a randomized experiment among 1.4 million people on Facebook, and we were trying to measure how different people uh, uh, were susceptible 
people to messages from their peers, and we did this on the dimension of your relationship status. Okay, so single, in a relationship, engaged, married, and it's complicated. And what we found were that single people were indeed more susceptible to influence than people who didn't report their relationship status. People who are in a relationship were even more susceptible to influence than single people. People who are engaged were even more susceptible to peer influence than people who were in a relationship. And people who were married were not susceptible to peer influence at all, apparently. Uh, and if it was complicated, uh, that they were the most susceptible uh, to peer influence, <laughs> apparently. And so uh, my colleagues and I uh, debate what is going on here. And so if you would like to, to discuss any of these findings with me, I encourage you to come talk to me at the break. But more importantly, uh, tell your friends to come talk to me. Thank you. <laughs>